I will, uh, I will begin with a word of prayer, all right? So, did you hit, hit record? Okay, cool. Dear Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you for this day. We thank you for there not being snow yet. I uh, pray that you be with us today. Help us to understand a little bit more about your creation and uh, just to enjoy the math, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, I seem to not be able to find my roster, so I will go old school and just let you write your name. You, you do know how to write your name, right? Okay, so that's good. Ordinarily, I'd show you pictures of my kids and blah, 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 but then there was Trump. All right, so <clears throat> last thing, we already talked about what's a ring, what's a group, what's a field, so I hope you watch that. But the takeaway message from that was that we're mostly going to be working with R, a commutative ring. Um, and to say R is a commutative ring is really not to say too much. I mean, this is a very familiar thing. Um, for example, examples include the integers, um, like the integers mod um, something. So these modular arithmetic things I talked about last class too. Um, well, last video. Um, complex numbers, um, et cetera. Uh, you know, most things you can think of where you have a notion of addition and a notion of multiplication. So what we do have in a commutative ring is that, I'll just run through it real quick, we have something called zero, zeros in the ring, and we have that x plus zero is equal to x. Um, there's something called one in the ring, and we have one times x is equal to x. So zero is the uh, additive inverse, I mean, zero is the uh, additive identity. One is the multiplicative identity. We have both of these things in a ring. Um, addition behaves nicely, it's commutative, like x plus y is equal to y plus x. Um, x plus y plus z is equal to x plus y plus z. In other words, addition is associative. It doesn't matter which order you do, two of them. You get the same answer, right? We know this. Um, you mean to tell me there are other operations more abstract than addition where this doesn't work? Yeah, that's true. There is. Um, you know, and there's an additive inverse, right? There's, we can always find, for each x, you can find a minus x such that when you add them together, you get zero. What else do we have for a ring? We can multiply in the natural way. So like the other thing we get is if I have a times, say, x plus y, I get ax plus a y. I, I also have the other kind of distributivity. If I have like a plus b times x is equal, I get ax plus bx. Nothing I'm writing here should be terribly shocking to you. This is the usual laws of arithmetic, right? Addition commutes. Addition and multiplication distribute in this way. They're, they're both associative, right? If I have a times b times c, I don't really need parentheses, right? I could put them this way or I could put them that way. I get the same answer associativity of multiplication. Let's see anything, anything else that is worth making a note of here. I said commutative. Now what, what, what does that refer to? This commutative refers to the multiplication. So what that tells us is that a times b is equal to b times a. All right. So all these things together give us the structure of a commutative ring. And again, just to summarize, we can add and we can multiply in the usual way. All right. So today I'm going to tell you about matrices and about how we can do matrix math over a commutative ring. If you look at last year's notes, you'll find that I had real numbers for all the matrices, right? Basically all I've done is taken those notes and cut and paste R in the place of like double bar R. So. <laughs> This is the real numbers, right? The real numbers are also a ring, because you can add them and you can multiply them in this natural, or these natural set of laws. Any questions so far? OK, so <clears throat> before I get to matrices, I have one, other, one order of business, which is induction. What is induction? Some of you haven't seen induction before formally. So the idea of induction is we have some claim P. And it has some dependence on n, where n is a natural number. So to claim 
let me just state the basic idea. Um, to prove P of n true for all n in the natural numbers, we may, step one, show P of 1 is true. And step two, we can assume that P of n is true for some n greater than, um, well, greater than or equal to 1. The quality doesn't hurt. And then and you have to show that, assume that, assume that it's true for, P, for n and show P of n plus 1 is also true. Then by the properties of the natural numbers and what's called the technique of proof by mathematical induction, it follows that the claim is true for all n. This is proof by mathematical induction. All right. I'll show you an elementary example of this before I get too carried away. Let's see here. How about this? 1 plus, uh, plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus n is equal to what? Do you guys know? n times n plus 1 over 2. Let's see here. That's some kind of crazy claim. Let's check it. So this is the claim. This is so-called P of n. All right, that's the claim. Is P1 true? Consider n equals to 1. So we have 1. Uh, that's, uh, that's it. That's the, this, this is just 1 when n equals 1, right? And 1 is equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2. Is that true? Um, yeah, that's 2 over 2. OK, so yeah. So clearly, p of 1 is true. All right, next step. Assume inductively that uh, p of n is true. And let me be more specific here, that 1 plus 2 plus da da da, da plus n equals to n times n plus 1 over 2 for some n in the natural numbers. My next step is to consider the n plus 1 case. So to show n plus 1 is true, I got to go one side or the other and try to get it back to the other. I mean, so I think to me the most I, I mean, I could try to start on the right-hand side of the claim, but my goodness, that, that doesn't seem like a good idea. I'm going to start on the left-hand side. So what do we have? We got 1 plus 2 plus da 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 plus n, and then I should add 1. Now what's my goal? My goal is to show that this is equal to the formula with n replaced with n plus 1. So what can I do? What's my first move? I can use the induction hypothesis, which states what? I'll underline it. This stuff right here is the same as that. And we're already assuming inductively that that is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. But then I still have plus n plus 1, right? You guys know algebra. There's a common factor of n plus 1 here. We can factor it out, right? So this is n plus 1 times what? Times n over 2 plus 1. Right? Now I want to factor out a half because I see the formula has a half in it. So factor a 2 out, what do I got? 1 half n plus 1 times what? n plus 2. But what's n plus 2? I'll write it somewhat color codedly. So we got n plus 1. <coughs> times n plus 1, you know, plus 1. In other words, this is exactly that formula with n plus 1 in the place of n. So therefore, p of n plus 1 is true. 
and we conclude that P of n is true for all n in the natural numbers by proof by mathematical induction. That's a nice abbreviation, right? Proof by mathematical induction. This is a pretty famous example, right? This is the one we think Gauss knew about when the teacher asked him to add the numbers from 1 to 100. And then he just like 5,050 and put down, his <laughs> put down his slate immediately. And the teacher, the story goes, the teacher's like, you know, she's trying to buy some time to prepare the next lesson or whatever. This clown has just made his, her, her time waster into like a nothing. But, you know, Gauss, there's a lot of stories like this. Gauss correcting his father's ledger when he was three. His father was an accountant or something. But anyway, this is a pretty standard example. Let me, not a typical induction in here. Usually the inductions in here require less, much less um, ingenuity. Definition. Um, <clears throat> if, let's say, a sub i are an element of a ring, a commutative ring. So by the way, throughout the rest of this lecture, r is going to be a commutative ring. I'm not going to keep writing that. Let, let us be understood that for the next lecture, few lectures, r is a commutative ring. Um, so if, if you have elements in a commutative ring, then we can define the sum i equals 1 to n of a sub i by a sub n plus the sum i equals 1 to n minus 1, where a sub 1 is equal to 1, uh, is equal, well, excuse me, where the sum i equals 1 to 1 of a sub i is just equal to a sub 1. In other words, this is a recursive definition of the finite sum. So let's, let's just let's take this definition out for a spin for a second here. What happens when you put, how does this work? If I look at sum i equals 1 to 2 of a sub i, how's that, how's that go? This is going to be a sub 2 plus the sum i equals 1 to 1 of a sub i, which is what? Then by definition, the sum from 1 to 1 is just a sub 1, right? That's where the recursion starts. And so we got ourselves a sub 2 plus a sub 1. Now, usually we write this what? Like this, right? We t tend to write things in increasing order of indices just as a point of, uh, I don't know, it's a habit. It's not a bad habit. But um, there you go. That's how this definition works. Now, you're like, but. I thought I already knew about sums from 1 to n. Well, you probably did, right? But I bet no one ever really defined it for you. Well, I mean, how many people saw this definition in Calc 2? I didn't think so, right? OK, so <clears throat> why do we care about definitions? We care about definitions because if we want to prove something carefully, we need a definition, right? So a property of the finite sum is as follows. There's a couple properties. The one is that if we have the sum of a sub i plus b sub i, i equals 1 to n, then this is equal to a sum i equals 1 to n of a sub i plus a sum i equals 1 to n of b sub i. Right. How do we prove, and this is true for all n in the natural numbers. That's a proposition. By the way, one of my current issues with my notes I haven't rooted out. Sometimes I call things propositions. Sometimes I call them theorems. I'm thinking we should have some kind of like n renaming contest. I'll make a list of all the propositions and theorems in my notes, and then we'll take a vote on which one should actually be a theorem and which one should actually be a proposition. I think this would be a fun game to play because my current system of naming is rather ad hoc. Like some things are theorems that are much easier than other things that are propositions. It's just it's, it's all out of whack. Sorry about that. 
Anyway, so I'm just trying to discourage you from thinking too deeply about why I've called something a theorem versus a proposition. It's, 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 don't, don't think that hard. OK, so first, this is true for all n, right? So this is a inductive claim. So we got to use proof by induction to prove this, all right, to be careful. So here it goes. Is it true for the case n equals 1? You know? Sum i equals 1 to 1 of a sub i plus b sub i is what? a1 plus b1 by the definition. So all I'm doing here is by definition base case. So the claim is true for n equals to 1. What's our next step? It's induction proof. So suppose inductively that the sum i equals 1 to n of a sub i plus b sub i <laughs> is equal to a sum i equals 1 to n of a sub i plus a sum i equals 1 to n of b sub i for some n in the natural numbers. That's our induction hypothesis here. What do I want to look at then? I want to look at n plus 1. What do I have to work with? Not much, really. So let's look at sum i equals 1 to n plus 1 of a sub i plus b sub i. So my first step would be that this is a sub n plus 1 plus b sub n plus 1 plus the sum i equals 1 to n of a sub i plus b sub i. And then over here I'll say by definition of the sum, finite sum, right? Right? You see, why I'm, you see how I've used the definition? Do you, I hope you're following. What's my next step? So I'm going to make a stack of arguments here. These equalities follow. So next one. So a sub n plus 1 plus b sub n plus 1. What's my next step? At some point in an induction argument, you're going to have to use the induction hypothesis. This is that place. Right? I can trade. I can trade this for these two guys, right? By the induction hypothesis. And then what? Well, I can group things, right? You see what I can do? This guy and this guy come together to give us what? What is it? <coughs> what is it? Oh, that's suppose. Yeah. Now by explaining the shorthand I, shorthand, I have undone its usefulness. Oh, well. <clears throat> and then, how about this guy? Bn plus 1. These two together give me this, right? What did I use to get from the, the middle step to the last step? Once more, I used by the definition of the finite sum. Right? But that's exactly the claim for n plus 1. We've proved the sum breaks up, right? So thus, the claim is true by proof by mathematical induction since I've showed that n implies n plus 1. OK, so one of your homework problems is very much like this. 
In your homework, I have asked you to prove through a similar argument that if you have c times a sub i, i equals 1 to n, that that's equal to c times the summation i equals 1 to n of a sub i. To be clear, I, I, there's something I forgot to say at the start of this. W where am I assuming that a sub i and b sub i are from? Little fine print back here. a sub i and b sub i are elements of the commutative ring R um, for all i in the integers, right? I mean, all i and n. <clears throat> I mean, I want to assume that they're where I can apply the definition, right? All right. Now, if you've had Math 200, this should be totally, like, boring. Now, some of you have had Math 250. I've gotten mixed answers about whether or not you've covered induction in there. So that's why I covered it in here, just because you may have had a Math 250 where you didn't do induction very deeply. So anyway, I think you can see that the induction here doesn't really require a lot of cleverness, right? It's pretty much, I, and I understand you're doing an inductive argument and use the definition, it just falls right out, right? It's not that complicated. <coughs> All right, so matrices. What is the matrix? Right. Oh man, my shirt is letting me down. I'm gonna have to use more of the juice. You guys have a good break? My break was not long enough. <clears throat> there are other properties of finite sums that I'll be using in here. The other main one is that if you have two finite sums like in a row, Suppose you have a sum over i and a sum over m. Then you can switch the order of them. But um, I'm not going to write that down. It's in the notes. And um, I'll point out when we're using it, when we use it in future lectures. The properties of finite sums, of course, are kind of in the background of a lot of what we're doing. So there's that. <coughs> Class ends at 1, right? Uh, I tried. So <clears throat> A is an element of R. M by N is to say that A is an M by N matrix with elements, well, with components. in this commutative ring R. Again, the, the, the ring could be lots of things. It could be real numbers. It could be complex numbers. It could be, you know, um, it could be lots of things. <coughs> so some fundamental notation. A matrix is basically an array. So we got like A11 and so forth, all the way over to A1n, A21, A2n, and down here, AMN, AM1. So this has M rows and N columns. All right. A is a matrix. AIJ is what? Right, a component, or sometimes they'll say an element of um, use a component of the matrix. <clears throat> so this is an element of R in particular. So for this matrix. So this this thing I have up here, R M by N, is actually the set of all M by N matrices over R. Okay. <clears throat> I'll do this, um, you know, like row one 
of A is equal to, sorry for the rerun from you guys who were here last time, um, 1, 1, A, 1, 2, da da da, A, 1, N. That's row 1. That's actually an element of what? How many rows are there in here? One. How many columns? N. So this is a 1 by N matrix. Each row is itself a matrix of a different size. And we can also write column 1 of A is A11, A21, dot, 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 A, M1. And this, by the way, our notation, we have a sneaky notation in here because writing columns is kind of a drag. So we like to have a sneaky notation, which is a column, but without writing a column. And to do that, I do this parenthetical thing here. So this is a, it's a hidden notation of this course, all right? I don't like to do this kind of notational thing too much, but it, it's kind of a necessary evil to avoid bad typesetting. Because <clears throat> I do like to talk about columns. But I don't like to have a column, an explicit column, in the middle of a, uh, you know, a line of text. So I need something to make columns into rows. I have two options. I can, either, I can either write it like this. So this is a sneaky notation. This actually means that. I'm just, this is a definition I'm making. So there's a difference between putting these kinds of brackets and putting these kinds of brackets. See those? I distinguish those. OK? Be aware of that. Now this is an element of R what? N by 1. That's right. Now these are primary in here. So actually, the notation we use for this is just R upper N. In other words, I identify the set of column vectors with the n-fold Cartesian product of the ring itself. Right? R to the n power is understood to be R cross R cross R cross R da, 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 cross R n-fold Cartesian products. So column vectors are kind of primary in here. That's why we have this notation. Um, that's just the first column in the first row. I'm going to use the sneaky color coding argument I used last time to show you how to get the ith one. I mean, you can already see it from, from up here, right? But the ith, so i, hey, hey, hey which is the row, the first one, right? So we change my ones to i's. And then over here, change my ones to i's. So in a column vector, the column index is fixed. In the row vector, the row index is fixed throughout the vector, right? By the way, we could say this, row sub i of A, the jth component of that is what? And the, maybe I should, well, I'll talk about the jth column. Well, I'm sorry. If I use I in here and here, I'm using it in a different sense. I'm just going to do that. I tell you, I'm not. I'm going to, I'll make up my mind here eventually. The jth column of A, the ith component of that is what? This is AIJ. This is also AIJ. What do I mean by like ith component of a vector? So for example, this is the second component of that vector. I sense some people don't follow me. Let me just write something out here. So if v is equal to, say, v1, v2, da da da, vn, then v sub, you know, um, well, let me say alpha. Alpha. I'm using a different letter for a second here. Then v sub j is by definition alpha sub j. I mean, <sighs> sorry. When I write parentheses in like a sub thing, that means pick off that component of it. And I'm using angle bracket as sort of a generic notation to think of either column vector or row vector for the moment. All right. Are we good on this basic notation? I hope. All right. Let me talk to you about something that's slightly more interesting. 
Can I erase? Sure. I'm, I'm erased. <coughs> so the algebra of matrices is very interesting. So first of all, if I have A and B and they're M by N matrices, then A plus B is also an M by N matrix. Um, and how do we define it? Likewise, if um, C is an element of the ring, then CA is an element of Rm by N, where CA IJ is by definition. So these are, these are definitions right here. How do we add matrices? How do we scale or multiply matrices? It's one of those definitions I give in here I think that everyone would make even if I didn't tell you. Like I could safely skip this and you would all still know what to do. <laughs> but um, you do it component wise is the thing, all right? Now for which i and j does that have to be true? Yeah, all of them. So this is for both of these things are true for i comma j, an element of n sub m across n sub n, which is just a sneaky way of saying that i ranges from 1 to m, and j ranges from 1 to n, n as in nenu nenu, m as in mummy. All right. Now that we have that settled, I could do an example, I suppose. Here, I'll do an example. I won't be accused of not writing a number in this lecture. I'll write several of them. All right, so, I mean, I've written one and two a bunch of times. I think I did that. I mean, M and N are arbitrary. That's like writing all numbers at once. If you think about it, I've written infinitely many numbers in this lecture already. So let's see here. How about zero bar, one bar, two bar, three bar, plus four bar, five bar, six bar, two bar. And we're going to do this calculation over z mod, you pick it. What do you want to do? Anything bigger than 6. Oh, wait a minute. Not too big, though. Let's make it interesting. 12. 12 is not interesting. Try again. 11 is still not interesting. No, it's still not. I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I got to take the reins away from you guys. 8, yeah. 8. We need 8, because otherwise it's just addition. <laughs> so. This is 0 bar plus 4 bar. You add component wise, right? 1 bar plus 5 bar, 2 bar plus 6 bar, 3 bar plus 2 bar. So these are just, uh, the bars are to remind us that they're not ordinary numbers, that they are subject to the rules of modular arithmetic mod 8, which is kind of boring here for three of the components, because that's just 4 bar, that's just 6 bar. Now, 8 bar is what, though? <coughs> right, so this one, 8 is equal to 0, essentially, in Z mod 8. So there you have it. But you just you add component-wise. All right? In my notes, I prove properties of matrix addition and scalar multiplication, which are kind of like not surprising. Like A plus B is equal to B plus A for matrix multiplication, right? There are other things that are true for matrix multiplication. Like for example, if I have C1, oops. If I have, for example, if I have a C1 plus C2 times a matrix, you know what I get? I get C1 times A plus C2 times, uh, C2 times A. And if I have C1 times A plus B, I get C1 times A plus C1 times B. So the usual laws of like addition and multiplication by numbers 
they work just as well with matrix addition and scalar multiplication. Um, all right. <coughs> now, matrix multiplication, on the other hand, is something new. How do we multiply matrices? Yeah. Oh no. So the the when I draw vertical bars in matrices or bake crosses in them, all that is is just um, you know it's it's a what's the word? It's an organizational aid. It's not really part of the matrix per se. I mean, we have some customs, like we'll draw a dotted line in the augmented matrix, but it's still, you know, if it's a three by four matrix with the dotted line, it's still a three by four matrix without the dotted line. It's just kind of a, um, I don't even know what the word. Just to make it not confused. Yes, that's right. I was saying that in a very confusing way, but thank you. Um, <laughs> so that's good. Now, um, another example of that would be these commas. Well, the commas are not op like the co commas have to be here in the column notation. <laughs> you'll see why as you just think if you just think about it as you go on, you'll see why these commas have to be here. But on the other hand, sometimes when I write a row, I don't write commas. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll write dividers in. All right. So, um, in fact, that's that's what's known as concatenation. Concatenation. So if I have like, if A is say M rows by N columns, and suppose B is say M rows by Q, Q columns, then you can either form A, B, or you can form B, A. And these will be bigger matrices, which are formed from gluing those together. So there's, I mean, there's also that use of this like bar notation, which is interesting, more interesting than what I was doing there. This is a what? This is an M by how many columns does it have now? Yeah, N plus Q columns. Concatenation is actually very interesting and, and one of the really fun things we do in terms of matrix operations in here. So that anyway, ma matrix multiplication, we need to make a definition. How do you multiply two matrices? A, an element of R M by N, and B, an element of R n by, let's say, p um, are multipliable. So when I say two matrices are multipliable, that means that the number of columns on the first one matches the number of rows on the second one. Those have to match up, otherwise the matrix multiplication doesn't make sense. So this guy and the, the, those guys, they have to match. That's what it makes them multipliable in that order. <clears throat> then AB is an element of our M by P where AB IJ is by definition the sum I equals 1 to, um, oh I'm sorry not I, sum K equals 1 to N <coughs> of A sub I K, B sub K, J. So that, that's the definition of matrix multiplication as c concisely as I can make it. Now there are special cases, yeah? Uh, what's the very top right symbol or letter there? R by M by M by This? Yeah. No. Q, oh, the Q, Q, that? That one. Q. So if two, mat two matrices are multipliable, this is how we multiply them. Now, um, there are some special cases like um, you know, let me just special cases. You've got um, matrix. <laughs> times column, so that would be like m times n times n times 1. 
the output in this case, it's just going to be a, an m, m as in mummy by 1. So like this, in this case, this definition, it, it breaks down to the following. A v um, sub j is equal to a sum i uh, sub k equals 1 to, to, to n of a sub um, a sub i j v sub i. No, that's wrong. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Um, this has to be i over here. I'm trying to use i as, well, anyway, I'll, let me shut up. So i k v k. There we go. That's what I should write. Um, also, if you have a row, um, if we have a row times a matrix, this rule simplifies to a slightly different, I mean, there's not two indices is the thing. So a row would be like, um, let's say 1 times m times m by n. So that should, that should give us, I mean, this, this is a what? It's an m by 1, right? It's another column vector. This gives me altogether a 1 by n, so we get a row vector as an answer. In particular, um, let's say w times a, um, the jth component of that will be equal to a sum. Um, k equals 1 to m of w um, k a k j. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a problem. Now that, that definition is, 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 is great for proving things directly. Um, but in terms of how I actually calculate a product of two matrices that actually have things in them, I typically use a slightly different rule. And um, so here's how the rule goes. If I have you know, A and B as in the definition, then AB is equal to um, let's see here, how's it go? I take like row i of a, and I take the dot product of that with um, column j of b. Now, I, I forget what I wrote in my notes, and I left my notes in my office, so I'm annoyed. I can't remember what I did here in terms of specific notational choices, but that's the idea. Oh, you know, another notation. This can also be written as brackets a i j. We should not write a i j equals to a. This is nonsense. This is forbidden. This is OK. All right, so I'm saying that, in other words, the i j th the i j th component of a b is rho a dot product with column b. Do you guys know the dot product? Some of you had not had calculus 3, so you don't know. Let me tell you. To take the dot product of two vectors, suppose we have like v1 vn dot product with w1, wn. They have to be the same size. If they're the same size, you take the dot product just by multiplying corresponding components and adding them. So like v1, w1 plus v2, w2 da, 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 plus vn, wn. There you go. That's the definition of the dot product. Now, written in summation notation, it's like this. Sum i equals 1 to n of vi, wi. dot product. So I'm claiming that 
the matrix formed from dot products of rows of the left factor and columns of the right factor, that is the same as this definition I put over here with all these mysterious indices. All right, so how do we prove that? So last time, I, I emphasized to those of you who are here, we, two, we show two matrices are equal by showing that their components match. Right? That's our, tip, that's our typical method of proof for proving something's true about a matrix. So what I want to do here is I want to look at AB, and I just want to look at, say, the, um, the ijth component. All right? And <clears throat> so what is that? Well, by definition, that's what? Some k equals 1 to n of a i k b k j. So this is by definition of matrix multiplication, all right? But, but what is that? What is, what is AIK? AIK. So replace this J with a K. And you see what you have is you have the Kth component of the Ith row. This is row I of A, the Kth component. And what about BKJ? What's that? Well, you notice that, I mean, the, the J is fixed there, right? So that's, that's, that's the, hey, that's the kth component of the Jth column. Excuse me, the kth component of the Ith column, I should say. No, Jth what? Jth column. Yeah, I'm an idiot. So kth component of the Jth column. Column J of A. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm multiplying corresponding components of rows and columns. One with one, two with two, three with three, and so forth, and I'm adding them up. That's the dot product. That's exactly the dot product. Yes? Oh, B, yes, thank you. Obviously, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that, that is exactly row I of A dot product with column J of B. But i and j are arbitrary, so that shows that these formulas and that calculational approach is the same. All right, so as an example, suppose I have 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar, 3 bar, and I'm multiplying it by um, 4 bar and 5 bar. And we'll work in z mod 6z this time. I'm making mo all my examples modular arithmetic because I think there's a subset of you who have never seen those before. <laughs> I want you to have a little bit more experience with it before, you know, too long. I think if I put real numbers in here, if you can do this, you can certainly do the real number case. All right. So zero times, so what I do is I do zero bar times four plus one bar times five bar. And 2 bar times 4 bar plus 3 bar times 5 bar. Let me try to color code what I'm doing. I'm saying like this row vector dotted with the column vector gives me that. See, 1 with 1 plus 2 times 2. See it? 0 times 4, 1 times 5, like that. And likewise, the second, the second entry there this guy comes from taking the dot product of this row with that column, 2 times 4, 2 times 4, plus uh, 3 times 5, like that. Now the rest, we just got to do some arithmetic in z mod 6, which is what? This is 0, this 5. I get 8. This, this gives me what? This gives me 8 bar plus 15 bar 
which is what? 23 bar, which is otherwise known as 5, because we can subtract off copies of 6. You can subtract 18 from that without changing. This is, this is equal to, um, what did I say, 5 bar. So there you have it. All right, so anyway, next class, which I probably won't get to see you in person for, we will cover further properties of matrix multiplication and such. Um, I think the homework is going to be due Wednesday. I'm a little bit behind, so I'm sorry about that. The homework is posted in course content, so you can go work on it. And you should remember to read my lecture notes. Like, I'm not following the textbook quite yet. We will, after quiz one especially. But up to quiz one, I'm just collecting all of my favorite matrix operations that you guys should know and work through. So.